and welcome to X-Ray Review. In this video we're going to go through some of the more common spinal fractures that you see listed here. Let's start with the most common spinal fracture which is a compression fracture. The normal radiographic appearance of the vertebral body is squared without loss of anterior vertebral body height. With an acute spinal compression fracture on radiographs you're going to see a loss of anterior vertebral body height a step defect anteriorly, and possibly a zone of condensation where the bone has been compressed. With a chronic spinal compression fracture, there will be a loss of vertebral body height, bony remodeling, and then possible associated degenerative findings. Here's an example of multiple spinal compression fractures. The key radiographic appearance is a loss of vertebral body height seen on the lateral view. If you look at the normal squared appearance of the vertebral body and then the loss of anterior vertebral body height in comparison to the posterior vertebral body, you should be able to spot this loss of vertebral body height. A step defect is an abrupt perpendicular break in the cortex seen anteriorly. And this is only uh, visualized with acute compression fractures. The zone of condensation is this impacted or compressed bone, which shows up as an area of increased density on the radiograph. The mechanism of injury for compression fracture is going to be axial compression with flexion. And this most commonly occurs at T12L1, however, can occur anywhere in the spine and it is the most common fracture of the lumbar spine. So there are traumatic compression fractures which are abnormal forces on normal bone and then there can be pathologic fractures which are abnormal forces on abnormal bone and traumatic fractures usually have a loss of anterior to central vertebral body height and they spare the posterior vertebral body mostly. And they're usually solitary, they can be multiple, but they're usually going to involve multiple adjacent segments. With pathologic fractures, you can see a posterior or global loss of vertebral body height. They can be solitary or their involvement can be scattered throughout the spine. A burst fracture is related to high energy compressive axial loading spinal trauma that involves a disruption of the posterior vertebral body cortex and often retropulsion of bony fragments into the spinal canal. And this can occur from severe accidents such as a motor vehicle collision. The radiographic features of a burst fracture include a loss of vertebral body height on the lateral views. The anterior portion is commonly more compressed than the involved posterior portion. And there can be bony fragments or retropulsion into the spinal canal. And then on the frontal radiograph, you should be able to see interpedicular widening, which is a widening of the space between the pedicles. Burst fractures most commonly occurred L1, with the majority occurring between T9 and L5. Often the intervertebral disc is driven into the vertebral body below. For the next fracture we're going to discuss, we have to review two terms. First is a spondylolysis. This is an interruption of the pars interarticularis caused by a stress fracture during childhood or adolescence. A spondylolisthesis is a term used to describe any anterior displacement of a vertebral body in relation to the segment immediately below it. So a spondylolysis is a common stress fracture of the pars interarticularis, which is the weakest portion of the vertebral segment and vulnerable to repetitive stress or overuse. Radiographically, what we're looking for is a radiolucent line at the pars interarticularis, and this is indicative of that pars defect. Spondylolisthesis is an anterior translation of a vertebral segment. Radiographically, you should see an anterior translation of one segment in relation to the one directly below. The Wilts classification of spondylolisthesis categorizes spondylolistheses by their etiology. 
So a type 1 is a congenital or dysplastic. Type 2 is an ismic, which is a pars defect and very common. Type 3 is degenerative due to facet arthrosis. Type 4 is traumatic and is not very common, can be seen in the cervical spine and things like a hangman's fracture. Type 5 is due to underlying pathologic bone, so things like bone marrow diseases, metastasis, where the underlying bone is weakened. And type 6 is post-surgical or iatrogenic. Sometimes you can get a fusion and then excessive motion at the segment above, which then causes atypical stresses and then a spondylolisthesis. Another common fracture of the spine are transverse process fractures, and these are usually a result of blunt force trauma. Radiographically, we're looking for radiolucency extending through one or more of the transverse processes, and this can be very challenging to see, and computed tomography is the gold standard for finding a transverse process fracture. These types of fractures are often associated with other traumatic injuries, such as neurovascular, hepatic, or splenic injuries. Let's take a look at a common fracture in the cervical spine. A clay shoveler's fracture is a fracture of the spinous process of the lower cervical or upper thoracic spine. Radiographically, we're going to see a radiolucency extending through one or more of the spinous processes. The mechanism of injury for a clay shoveler's fracture is repetitive extension, acute forceful flexion or extension, or blunt force trauma. These types of cervical fractures are considered a stable injury. While surgery is not a typical outcome for these types of fractures, a medical consultation for evaluation and management is still recommended. Here's an example of a previous C2 fracture. One of the most common fractures of C2 is the base of the dens, or a type 2 fracture. And this is the most common type to result in a non-union, which is sometimes called an osodontoidium. And radiographically, what we're looking for is a radiolucency extending through the base of the dens. The mechanism of injury for this type of fracture is due to forced hyperflexion or forced hyperextension injuries. These types of fractures are an unstable injury and require a neurosurgical consultation. Coccygeal fractures can be very challenging to identify on radiographs due to atypical osseous anatomy, overlying soft tissues, and technical factors. The lateral projection is often the most helpful when it comes to visualizing the radiolucency seeing the fracture in any displacement. On radiographs, most coccyx fractures will have a transverse orientation and demonstrate some displacement. Management of coccygeal fractures is almost always non-surgical. Fractures of the ribcage are a very common consequence of trauma and can be easily missed on radiographs. Up to 50% can be missed even with oblique projections. The more views of the ribs, the better. Multiple oblique projections are preferred. There are many potential complications of rib fractures. Some of the more common ones include involvement of the brachial plexus or subclavian vessels, pulmonary structures, or solid organs such as the liver, spleen, or kidneys. The best method of ruling out a rib fracture is ultrasonography or computed tomography. These are more sensitive and specific than conventional radiography for rib fracture detection in trauma situations. If there are no associated complications, rib fractures themselves are treated symptomatically and typically have a good prognostic outcome. 
And thank you very much. If you made it this far, uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And any questions or comments, please put them below. Thank you again.